Thank you, Congressman Scalise, for joining us and for those important reminders about the significance of the uh, Wicked meeting in Dubai and the lasting lessons we should all take away from it. We have uh, two panels set up for this afternoon, as Alan Davidson had mentioned. By the way, I am Joe Waz. I was introduced 10 minutes ago, but just in case. Um, uh, and two terrific panels with a, a wide variety of, of perspectives. But under the, um, under the banner of the Internet Leadership Challenge, Restoring America to Economic Greatness Through Sound Internet Policy. Uh, what both panels have been asked to focus on this afternoon is finding common ground on how lawmakers and policymakers uh, can make the Internet an even more powerful platform for economic growth and national prosperity. And so to set the stage for the first panel, uh, we're going to hear the perspectives of two leading thinkers and advocates around these issues, uh, Blair Levin and Grover Norquist. Um, what I'd like to do is introduce Blair um, uh, to, to um, offer his perspectives and then Grover to offer his. Then when we sit down as a panel, I'll introduce um, our, our two other panelists, um, uh, Commissioner McDowell and uh, Bruce Melman. Um, before, we, uh, before I introduce our other two panelists and then jump in with some questions, let me mention as a housekeeping matter, uh, we only have an hour for this panel. We're down to about 40 minutes now. Uh, we're gonna, we'll accept written questions from the audience and hopefully there'll be some pads available to you and someone um, will be collecting them and, and slip them up here to me. And we'll try to slip a couple of audience questions in, but I think uh, we're also gonna have um, a lot of interaction among our panelists here. Um, so let me introduce our, um, our, two, um, uh, our two additional panelists. Bruce Melman um, is a founding partner of Melman Vogel Castagnetti, a government relations firm here in Washington. He also serves as executive director of the Technology CEO Council, as Blair mentioned, um, and as co-chairman of the Internet Innovation Alliance. He served under um, George, President George W. Bush as Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Technology Policy, uh, and had also represented Cisco Systems here in Washington, and before that served in congressional and campaign staff positions. And then our fourth panelist is FCC Commissioner Rob McDowell. Uh, he was originally report, appointed by President George W. Bush and unanimously confirmed by the Senate in 2006, then was reappointed by President Obama in 2009 and again unanimously confirmed. And so we'll be asking him today how we get policies done on a unanimous basis. <laughs> um, the commission has, commissioner has 16 years of private sector experience in the communications industry and public policy before his initial appointment, and he had been, has been involved in civic and political affairs for over three decades. So Bruce and Commissioner, welcome to both of you. And um, why don't I, I, I ask each of the two of you to respond to uh, what you've heard from our initial presenters. Um, each, I think, has framed their books and their arguments in terms of President Obama's legacy. Blair offers a more hopeful one, uh, Grover a somewhat more pessimistic one. Uh, so let me start with, um, with Bruce and let me ask you for your reactions from the two presenters. And in general, as we go into this, next, this new administration, um, are you hopeful or pessimistic about the administration's internet legacy? Uh, thanks for having me here, and I guess the short answer is both. Um, notwithstanding my partisan background, trying to be as objective as I can, I think the administration has done many things that I would hope they would have done, and they're admirable. Uh, some things, uh, a lot of things, where the outcome is to be determined, and there's some things that are that worry me. So uh, to start with the positive, uh, I think the administration has consistently shown a good commitment to research and development. Despite tough budget years, Grover might point out that it's gotten there in part with more than a trillion dollars of deficit each year, but nevertheless, R&D has not been short shrifted by any stretch. Um, health information technology is an area where, in fact, given the overwhelming role of the government as a uh, payer and participant in the health system, uh, government can, as a market maker and market participant, catalyze things in about $20 billion in the, uh, in the stimulus bill. Whatever one thinks of other elements of the stimulus bill, I think is uh, money well directed and, and uh, more likely than not to lead to a positive outcome. You know, the, uh, the report Blair was talking about that uh, he and Reed do a nice job in their books that is on the web, the one trillion reasons, ways that if you took what private sector companies do themselves, what service companies do for their customers in terms of data center uh, uh, consolidation or supply chain uh, rationalization, just taking a look at how much the government spends, assuming they only receive half or less of the savings of the private sector, there's still a trillion dollars that could be achieved. Folks like Jeff Zients in the administration are trying. Uh, they're hurt less by their own lack of commitment and more by the way the rules work. There was a great moment when I had some of the high-tech CEOs in front of government folks 
and they explained exactly how they've saved extraordinary amounts of money in their own operations and in customers' operations, and the response across government has, has been, yeah, but it doesn't score. And as a result, folks who are doing the budgeting can include known, proven, effective savings, and as one of my CEOs pointed out, well, it works everywhere except Washington. And the last thing I think that this administration deserves some credit for, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it's not passed, uh, but it's a, uh, it's a trade initiative that has a lot of creative pro-internet things in it. Um, it's got some work to get over the finish line, but it's certainly been heading in a positive direction. They've been listening. In the column of to be determined, spectrum policy. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if the incentive auctions uh, getting some of the broadcaster spectrum purposed for broadband succeeds or fails. I hope it succeeds. Um, but most prior years, certainly not the last four, but before that, the prior eight and the prior eight before that, we saw a lot more government spectrum being relinquished by the government and repurposed for private sector use. And I'm hoping we'll see some of that in the next four years available for auction. For all of the good intentions in the broadband stimulus money, I would rather have seen uh, uh, you know, two, three hundred megahertz of government spectrum uh, made available to the private sector. Blair, of course, would tell me it's a lot easier said than done. Privacy. Yeah, to you be, would say the same. <laughs> yeah, I would. <laughs> yeah. uh, to be determined uh, on privacy, it's, uh, I think the administration really wants to have a privacy policy, but wanting to have a privacy policy and promulgating smart regulations are not the same thing always. On immigration, I, I, I may have heard different things than Grover. I think the administration has been very supportive rhetorically of high-skilled immigration. The problem is it's a hostage right now. It's a hostage in, in the long multi-year battle on the hill between border fences and much more open immigration. I think if there were a way to have high-skilled immigration up for a vote alone, it would pass overwhelmingly and bipartisanly. And, and while I get you can't start with your fallback strategy because hostages are valuable in such things, I do hope uh, that part of the administration's legacy is that immigration reform, especially high-skilled, and last, on Internet governance, uh, you know, Rob was there before, I'm sorry, Commissioner Medal was there before anybody was there, uh, except perhaps David Gross, but that was the uh, last decade. Uh, we'll see. I think the administration has tried to do all of the right things. It didn't, they didn't succeed in Dubai, and that may be a sign of the times. Um, but so far, they've been trying to get the right outcome. In the negative column, uh, as Grover pointed out on tax, we have the highest corporate tax rate. The way companies have less than that as their effective rate is a bunch of loopholes, and so there's all kind of rent seeking. But the administration has for four years sought to increase the taxes on multinational high tech and other companies' efforts as they succeed in the global marketplace, raising taxes on our companies higher than every company in a territorial uh, country faces is not a way to make our internet sector stronger or our country more competitive. In the regulatory environment, Blair, uh, you know, I actually did get through all, I thought it was 4,000 pages of the broadband plan. Uh, there's a whole lot of great stuff in there. Noticeably absent wasn't what consumed the FCC and the administration for more than a year, net neutrality. I think that was a fight unneed, uh, not necessary, and I think it delayed a lot of the really creative and positive things and, and made the water um, unhelpful. We will see. I think there's a redemption opportunity for the administration as you take a look at the legacy regulations that once upon a time made sense for monopoly telcos, the congressman did a great job talking about them. They don't fit anymore. They don't make sense anymore. We're in a cross-platform environment. Uh, should the administration, with I am sure uh, uh, Commissioner McDowell's help, proceed forward to, uh, to uh, as there's now a proposal before the commission, to end these legacy regulations and to only minimally regulate a very competitive environment, they can move out of the negative column at least for the second term. The last two quickly. Uh, are on cyber, where again, information sharing has overwhelming bipartisan support. Everybody in the security infrastructure agrees. Smart information sharing policy would advantage uh, our cyber defenses, yet that's held hostage to a very real debate over whether the Department of Homeland Security has the competence and, and would be a value-added layer in oversight of critical infrastructure or not. Seems to me that debate should proceed as that debate, but that Congress, uh, with the administration's support instead of the opposition, should move forward a information sharing alone, and we can debate what remains. And then last, uh, you know, the, the fiscal battles. There was an Ezra Klein piece over Sunday pointing out that, you know, in a not pretty fashion, we have had more revenue, bless you, and less um, spending over the last couple of years. The big not yet put on the table thing that needs to be fixed, of course, is entitlements. And as long as we have entitlement systems whose design combined with the demography of our population are unsustainable, all of the spending which 
uh, there is some good government spending out there, research being one of my favorite, but infrastructure also being there and education being uh, valuable. As long as we don't rationalize our entitlement programs, the positive uses of government in our society are very much imperiled. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, Commissioner, your, um, your thoughts and perspectives, and are you on balance more uh, ho hopeful or pessimistic? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for having me, and uh, this is a terrific turnout. But what I didn't realize when I accepted this invitation is this is really a cleverly disguised book launch party. Uh, <laughs> although Bruce is reduced to a pamphlet, um, but I have nothing to show you uh, other than uh, my notes. Uh, so uh, congratulations on, on the book. So I look forward to reading all of them. I'm sorry to confess that I haven't actually touched them yet, but I, I will. Uh, in it's e basketball format season, or not, you're forgiven. It is, it's basketball season. Not much is gonna happen uh, through the the first Monday in April. But uh, in any case, um, I'll, I'll uh, be brief to try to distill the the, uh, the answer. And I agree with a lot of what uh, Bruce said, except for the parts that I don't understand. Um, <laughs> and uh, I do want to know, though, what uh, Mr. and Mrs. Melman fed you boys when you were uh, kids, uh, because uh, between you and Uncle Ken, you make uh, Mensa look like a remedial reading program. Not but, a lot um, of protein, so, obviously. <laughs> a lot of caffeine, though, I think. So <laughs> or your body naturally produces it. Um, my biggest concern going forward, um, uh, without a doubt, just to, to simplify, because we have a lot of topics to cover, uh, everything from internet policy to entitlement reform, uh, apparently, um, but is uh, the Title II docket. So what happens uh, should the uh, D.C. Circuit uh, overturn the uh, FCC's December 21st, 2010 uh, open internet order, also known as the net neutrality order? Uh, and the Title II docket uh, remains open. Uh, and that classifies or would classify internet uh, access uh, as uh, basically a, a telecom service. Uh, I think that's uh, dangerous from a variety of perspectives, uh, not the least of which would be economic growth, but would also fuel what is going on internationally. Uh, so what is very uh, interesting to see is it was very heartening uh, that uh, we had two unanimous uh, resolutions coming out of uh, Congress, one from the House, one from the Senate, uh, on this matter uh, to help uh, bolster our diplomatic team there in Dubai last month. Um, and all uh, a diverse array of, uh, of corporate and nonprofit uh, interests and internet government interests all saying pretty much the same thing, uh, which is that the international or multilateral uh, government structure should stay out of this space. Uh, but what we do in the U.S. Uh, is closely watched internationally. Uh, every time I travel abroad, which has been frequently uh, recently, uh, I'm reminded of this, um, that uh, what the FCC does in particular is read by hundreds of regulators and uh, government officials across the globe. So if we start to say, yeah, you know what, uh, it is okay to treat uh, what we'll say is just part of the internet in this manner, that continues to, to fuel uh, uh, the, the argument internationally. And what uh, scraps were, uh, were, that fell from the table that were not adopted in Dubai when the uh, ITU broke new ground and, and laid claim to jurisdiction over the internet, although it was doing so uh, based on the 1988 treaty language as well. Uh, so goodness knows how they'll try to leverage the, the language that was adopted by the 89 countries that adopted it. Um, but as we walk into the uh, World, World Telecommunications Policy Forum in Geneva in May, the WTPF, um, that puts internet governance squarely in the crosshairs uh, of the IT very explicitly. Uh, and to rewind the tape for a quick second, I remember just a few months ago we were being told that the wicket uh, would uh, be run through unanimous consensus without a hard vote and that the end result would not touch the internet. Both of those ended up being explicit falsehoods and probably del deliberate falsehoods uh, because it, there was a hard vote, 55 to 89, and it did expand its jurisdiction uh, into the internet. So in that folks can, uh, I feel as if though they can breathe a sigh of relief that things such as uh, sending party pays uh, was not explicitly adopted. That's not going to stop these uh, proponents who are very motivated, they're very patient, and they're incrementalists. And uh, so what happens in May in Geneva will lay the groundwork for uh, the plenipotentiary meeting uh, in November of 2014 in Korea where the ITU will elect a new membership and also reconsider uh, basically its constitution. So it's, it's in essence sort of a, what I call a constitutional convention for the ITU. And 
clearly they have the votes. That 55 to 89 uh, margin is very misleading in that uh, almost all of Europe, and, uh, except for the UK, God bless them, um, were willing to go in that direction until, as usual, Iran saved the day. Uh, I say that, of course, with tongue in cheek because they uh, put in a human rights amendment uh, that would uh, have uh, deemed uh, governments having human rights so they could therefore escape from some of the sanctions um, that they're under. Uh, and that uh, put Europe back into uh, the column of internet freedom. But Europe is uh, quickly uh, headed uh, in the opposite direction. Uh, you essentially have the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and maybe Australia as our only true allies on this. And that's not exaggeration. And, and keep in mind, a year ago, talk of UN regulating the internet was dismissed as black helicopter conspiracy theory. But, so here we are. So what we do here domestically with the, the Title II docket will be watched, and it'll be a big mistake uh, for our economy, but for freedom and prosperity everywhere, and especially in the developing world, if we adopt that. It's not needed, and it would be highly counterproductive. Uh, so that, and then uh, just a brief mention of uh, my concerns regarding where we will go with wireless policy, not just spectrum policy, and I agree with the, well, everything Bruce said about the executive branch needing to find, we need leadership at the very top to have cap cabinet officials responsible for offering up spectrum, and maybe work uh, with Congress to give executive branch agencies an incentive to relinquish uh, spectrum. I think Congress has a role here too. but. To, to step further down the road away from spectrum sharing, which can have its benefits, but it's not as robust a solution as uh, the auction of exclusive use licenses. Beyond that also, though, is just where are we going uh, with regulation of the wireless sector? Uh, this has been a bright, shining star of our economy for years, in large part because it has been largely unregulated. And if we're going to start uh, regulating it, we're going to start to see less growth in that sector. So uh, let's be very careful of that. And I'm, I'm concerned that the commission in the past four years has been laying the foundation for a more regulation, needless regulation of the wireless sector. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Commissioner. So we've had a lot of ideas uh, uh, spilled onto the table in the last uh, 25 minutes or so. And I think um, detecting some, some common ground on, on several ideas. Um, I think both Blair and Reed, and then uh, our, our two, um, uh, the commissioner and Bruce as well, everybody spoke in terms of uh, making spectrum assets available, um, both to uh, improve um, uh, mobile services in the U.S. as well as to uh, bring funds into the Treasury. Um, both Blair and Grover in their respective books talk about ways the Internet can be used as a tool toward better, cheaper, faster government. In fact, Grover, Grover had an interesting idea um, in the book um, saying there's no reason every single check written by federal, state, and local governments should not be available to every taxpayer to read in real time in an internet age. Same with every contract entered into, bank balances, every government, and so on. So really the, the internet is a transparency tool. Um, um, and I think that's something we find um, uh, pretty widespread agreement uh, on here. Um, and Blair, a lot of your ideas um, for smarter, faster, cheaper government um, uh, would be based on, um, on getting branches of the government to, uh, to think and act in ways about the Internet that they haven't yet. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I want to see if there's cause for optimism here as well, because in the broadband plan, um, three, almost three years ago, mm -hmm. uh, you put forward a lot of good ideas around education, health care, public safety. Um, you had the chance to socialize the ideas a lot, so has the, the chairman. Um, and uh, it's been, it was the, the, the topic of constant conferences here and, and around the country. Um, and maybe I would ask you and, and Commissioner McDowell, who also, um, um, uh, it was not, the broadband plan was not voted on by the agency, but it was an, a, a product of agency staff. Um, if you had to give a grade to not just the FCC, but the, the government in general, for how they have responded to, adopted, and acted upon the um, recommendations in the broadband plan. What grade would you give? I'd take the fifth, of course. <laughs> the fifth is a number. Right? Yeah. A grade. You drink a fifth? No, I, uh, yeah, <laughs> that would help. Uh, well, if, if, I took, if I drank a fifth, I might actually give a grade. Uh, <laughs> No, look, I, I, I appreciate the question. Um, I've, I've been asked it before, and I really, I, I'm very reluctant to do it, in part because whatever I say would get overly simplified. And, and I do think one of the things I, I've tried to do was, you know, get on and let the people, uh, some of whom actually are in this room, have to implement it, implement it. And I, I kind of think of it as, 
Um, I, I think I said in a speech once, uh, it's kind of like Mario Puzo who wrote the book, uh, The Godfather, uh, and then you know saw Godfather 1 and Godfather 2 and said, wow, that was really great, and then saw Godfather 3 and said, what was that? You know, I mean, there, there are certain parts of it that I'm actually quite pleased with. Uh, I do, I think the spectrum thing is important. It was glad Congress, you know, again, one of the few bipartisan things was to actually pass legislation providing incentive auction authority. I was certainly more hopeful um, when I left that we would get more government spectrum. Uh, but I don't think the blame is, I mean, I really do think it's harder than it looks. We had, you know, Larry Summers, we had Larry Strickland, we had the presidential executive order. I was in meetings where there was a lot of momentum to get it back, but it's, uh, it is really hard in that, and, and I do think Congress does need to act, actually, um, but I'm not, some of the ideas that have been proposed, like giving the agencies, you know, the benefit, that's been tried in other countries and just doesn't work because the agencies know that it'll be taken out in the budget. So um, I think that's, that's one where um, there's certainly more to be done. Part of the reason I wrote this book, it was, I, I do think that at the highest level, the president has to give a vision, and it really has to be enforced by OMB. And by the way, one of the things we suggest in the book is OMB have control over all the government spectrum, because I think actually if you did that, you'd have an internal and government incentives uh, that would be better. Uh, there needs to be leadership from the top that says, look, America is going to lead the world in delivering the economy based on bandwidth, and the government is going to lead the American economy. If you have a president say that, and if you have um, people held responsible for that, uh, then I think it happens. And um, I think, um, I'm not saying that I agree with the article in the New York Times about the president's uh, management, because a lot of it I disagree with, and I see it differently. But I do think it raises an important question, which is not a kind of partisan philosophical question, but it's how do you get the agencies and government to work in harmony? It's a very hard thing. But I think that that leadership about that great historic trans transformation uh, has to come uh, from the presidents and, and the White House. Mm -hmm. Joe, you've, you've been there. Um, what's your take? Look, OK, I have a very different view. The, the comment was made earlier uh, that technology has been driving economic growth. Um, all the technology we have is available to Zimbabwe okay, and North Korea. Somehow, the existence of technology does not create economic growth and jobs. Economic growth comes from property rights being legally enforceable, rule of law, uh, and freedom of contract. Those are the structures that we've organized, other countries have organized, some less well, uh, and some lessons we forgot on our own. But, but the, the base of a growing economy is, is, you know, you can forget, as they did, you know, how to make cement for a thousand years. I mean, you, you can have a steam engine and think it's a toy. I mean, if you don't have property rights, rule of law, and freedom of contract, if you don't have free markets and property rights blow it, you don't get economic growth. And edicts from the federal government are centralized in the president. You can send all the notes down you want, and East Germany still doesn't work, okay? So it, 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 I just, it, I think it's backwards. Uh, this top-down approach, the reason I wrote about transparency, um, is and a number of states have done it. Uh, Was the mayor's the a mayor of northern Texas came and spoke to us at our Wednesday meeting today, and talked about the fact that they just the entire checkbook of the city um, is Richardson I think, is is online. It's online. The, every check. Texas, the state has has done this at the state level. The governor did it for his offices a number of years ago, and then the comptroller um, Susan Combs did it for the rest of the state. Kansas has followed this model. Missouri did it by executive order and then a law. So there are a number of states, uh, Florida and Utah passed it statewide and required it of local governments as well. So there's some tremendous opportunities for people to find out what their government is doing. Remember when Virginia got talked into raising taxes because Warner said we were out of money? It turned out the bank accounts were full. You know, if everybody in Virginia had known what money was in the bank accounts when they were talked into a tax increase because they'd run out of money, that couldn't have happened. You can't lie to people if you have transparency on where you're hiding their money. Um, so transparency does a tremendous opportunity, but it empowers local voters, state voters, and the American people. And it's also a management tool because most government agencies don't have a very good idea of how their, mon how their money's being spent. Uh, and managers could see it as well as voters. But managers would live in fear that voters would see how the money is spent, and that would encourage them 
to behave. I think we can get spectrum, but I think it comes from not some the president deciding to do that, but understanding you don't have enough money to do what you want and you're not getting it in taxes. You want to sell off spectrum in order to have money to play more cylinders or whatever the project is this week. It's going to have to be spectrum. It's spectrum or you don't spend. That's what will move this administration, and the only thing that will move this administration to move on spectrum. And I think we'll get there over the next four years because we're having those conflicts on spending. Can I, can I sure. a couple of responses? Sure. First, I know you want to disagree with me, but I'm not sure exactly where the disagreement is because certainly it's not on transparency where um, I, I actually think one of, the, one of the best things I ever worked on was what became data.gov, and I know you are highly critical of the stimulus, but this, the stimulus, uh, part of the reason I think, you know, at least from a kind of fraud perspective, went reasonably well, that's a lot of money, was because right from the start there was a lot of transparency about how it was being spent. Secondly, in terms of spectrum, I would just note a lot of the spectrum is the Defense Department. They're not going to think, you know, unless you're willing to cut the defense budget, they're not going to think they need to give up spectrum. You, so you, you may have noticed we have plans to do just that. It is the law of the land. They're going to have to find $55 billion this next year. Right. They want to sell spectrum or they want to take the cuts. I think even the Defense Department will figure that out. Well, you, you, you might be right. I, let's put it this way. I haven't, in, in my own discussions with various people, have not seen that, that movement. They, they, don't think that, they don't think that the sequester is going to hit. Mm -hmm. I think they're wrong. Okay. Uh, and then finally, I would just note, it's not about, uh, you know, I, I, I love what the, the mayor of Kansas is doing, and all I'm saying is the federal government ought to do those kinds of things. And as Bruce noted, uh, when it comes to things like health care, the federal government is a big payer, and to have greater transparency and greater understanding of what really works and what doesn't, I think, is uh, really important. Great. I want to um, ask a question from the audience here and invite any other questions to be sent up uh, in the meantime. Um, uh, and it's identified, but from Carl Zabo of NetChoice. Uh, yesterday, France announced uh, a plan to tax businesses for the collection of <coughs> personal data, it says here. Uh, can you discuss ways for the U.S. to respond to protect our businesses? And also, how does this parallel to the overreach of uh, taxing powers that uh, Grover was talking about earlier? Rob, that's right up your alley. Ta France is taxing what now? What was it? Uh, that was a Grover answer. question. Sorry. <laughs> that's quite right. France, France, it says here, France announced a plan to tax businesses for the collection of personal data. Personal data. Data. Okay. Um, I, 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 no, I, no, I actually, I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with it. Okay. Basically, it's, it's another version of, I, I, if I understood it, uh, the France president proposed that Google and other businesses who collect, who effectively their business model is to collect data from individuals, be taxed um, on the basis of that data Some collection. Value. As if it was Some value. As if it was uh, yeah, or something like that. Well, you know, if I can just say a general, uh, observation. When you tax anything, you, you diminish it, uh, you control it, you, you can punish it, you tend to get less of it. So if, uh, if that's what France's goal is, it sounds like it is, that they don't want uh, personal data transactions uh, or personal data uh, being shared or whatever the case might be. I have no idea of what you're talking about here, but um, uh, but if that's their goal, then you know that applies to some of what Grover was saying regarding internet tax in general. Is that we we had a, a long-standing, overwhelmingly bipartisan consensus in this country to have an internet tax moratorium, mm -hmm. uh, and now that governments are finding that they're spending more than they're taking in, instead of cutting, they are taxing more or trying to tax more, thinking that will bring them more more revenue. Um, and it just reminds me of, you know, uh, to paraphrase Ronald Reagan, which is there are those who, when they see something moving, they tax it. <laughs> if it keeps moving, they regulate it. And if it stops moving, they'll subsidize it. Uh, and that uh, appears to be what's happening uh, with Internet policy throughout the globe. Yeah, your comment that if we do something goofy on Internet policy or, or, or net neutrality, other countries will jump in too. I mean, we need to watch out. The rest of the world really watches us. and. And they often either assume that this is coming if we did it, or, gee, we didn't think you'd get away with that, um, and now you can if we've done it to their companies. This the worldwide taxation system that we have, rather than a territorial taxation. I think we North Co North Korea and Papua New Guinea, or whatever, like the countries that do the worldwide taxation, it's not a good idea. We ought to back off of that. It's a major challenge. I think the administration is very wrong in its approach, and I think the high-tech community has been quite correct in saying we should go to a territorial tax system rather than worldwide. Other countries 
may try and do that. Back to us, this, this, this idea, the French inventing a new way to tax something is, is always problematic because bad ideas can spread. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question from the audience in the form of a speech, but I'll try to <laughs> uh, summarize it. Um, last week, the American Society, American Society of Civil Engineers released its 2013 Failure to Act report, finding an investment gap of over $1 trillion, $1 trillion between now and 2020, in the infrastructure spending on surface transportation, airports, seaports, waterways, drinking water, wastewater, and electricity. Yet, at the same time, the questioner says, some cities and municipalities are emb embarking on expensive and largely duplicative broadband networks. Is this really the right priority given the documented and huge unmet infrastructure needs, apparently totaling a trillion dollars of the country? I'll take a, I'll take a preliminary step. You know, that's interesting. It's like the, uh, we are, I think it's an unnecessary contrast between two worthwhile things. And while Grover is likely more of an expert on this than I, by the way, I would note for the audience, this is the only time in my life I've been to the right of Grover Norquist, and probably the only time I ever will. Uh, <laughs> Depends on your point of view, right? It's, yeah, right. It seems to me that uh, it's entitlement reform is the answer. And, and a, an organization called Third Way, which is a little left-leaning but still uh, more creative than many, has pointed out that for those who believe in infrastructure and whether it's the civil engineering and sewers and roads and bridges and so many things that are worthy and necessary and do need support or, or broadband networks which for the most part are privately maintained and what you need is the government to more often than not get out of the way but regardless of those two why set that false choice when the problem is often uh, that, that the counties California Chicago so many uh, Illinois so many places have set unsustainable pension promises which were easy to make and they don't have to deliver on them for years or unsustainable levels of, uh, of um, uh, social welfare support all of which is worthy and worthwhile but unsustainable and if the choices are increase taxes skimp on bridges uh, don't get all kids connected so that everybody's laptop can be hooked up because we want to make sure that we can get reelected through a promise of a public pension I'd say that's the wrong choice so I think it's a it's a false dichotomy in the question and if I could just add that I, I'm, I'm not sure the questioner is actually factually right. I actually don't know of any cities that are doing very large scale projects uh, which involve city money. What I do know is a number of cities like Seattle, Chicago, Kansas City, uh, and some others I'm working with in North Carolina and some other places are trying to figure out how to better utilize assets that are already existing to drive an upgrade of bandwidth net or broadband networks and I see no problem with that. Um, let's return uh, for a couple minutes to a um, to the question of the president's legacy and and use a statement that again uh, Grover quotes in his book uh, by the president uh, as as sort of a gauge or a measure. Um, it was a June 2011 press conference uh, when he was asked whether regulations might chill job growth, and the president said, "What I've done, and this is unprecedented, by the way, is I've said to each agency, don't just look at current regulations." Don't just look at future regulations, regulations we're proposing either. Let's go backwards and look at regulations that are already on the books, and if they don't make sense, let's get rid of them. Um, as we can start with, uh, Commissioner McDowell, um, in your judgment, has your agency responded effectively to the President's challenge? First of all, keep in mind that politically that was uh, made right in the wake of the 2010 election cycle. Uh, so uh, I think it's important to note. Uh, number two, to answer the question directly, I think uh, Chairman Janikowski deserves a, a lot of credit for a lot of uh, uh, rules that have been uh, cleared away that were outdated, uh, international settlements type rules, et cetera. Um, some that are on the list were actually just sort of cross, cross references and not actual rules. Um, but, you know, it's very easy for uh, the Commission to take one step forward and then two steps back uh, by injecting uh, a lot of uh, uncertainty through uh, the net neutrality order or through uh, the sort of uh, growing storm cloud of more regulation of the wireless sector. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, on, we can take uh, with one hand, give with the other, but uh, uh, what is the net effect of the new regulations that have been added on um, in the wake of any that have been uh, cleared away? Mm -hmm. Can I, can I just, sure. uh, I, there, there often are regulations that are outmoded and we should get rid of them, I'm totally in favor of. There are also certain kind of state rules, by the way, that really inhibit a lot of kind of internet um, applications. And I think, um, you know, again, Grover and I may disagree and that's fine, uh, but I think the government preempting certain kinds of interstate commerce to enable uh, internet applications to drive better 
uh, faster, cheaper, better is good. But I would just say that during my own experience of the FCC, one of the things I'm most proud of would be uh, a regulation which prohibited the wireline industry from putting on terminating access charges, very heavy terminating access charges on the wireless industry. It is not an accident that it was only after that that wireless went from being a, basically a premium luxury good to being a, uh, a mass market good. Uh, and I think most people look at that in retrospect and say that, that, that was a good one. Uh, another example that I, that I actually, I, I have no opinion on the ultimate outcome, but I would just note this summer the FCC um, eliminated certain things in the program access rules. Some of the entrance into the multi-channel video market, such as Verizon and AT&T and Google in Kansas City, objected, saying that it would make their investments uh, trickier. I don't really, I didn't study enough to know uh, which side is which side I would agree with. I would just say some of the regulations there, you know, regu you can say all regulation hurts investment. It actually doesn't work that way. Uh, Bruce, you just want to only if, if the question is, has this administration added or subtracted regulation? Um, I don't really think it's a matter of your partisan viewpoint, it's just a matter of math. It's a fact that there have been more economically significant $100 million plus impacting regulations in healthcare, in the financial services sector, in energy. You know, telecom, I think, is one of the few that has a shot, though, again, a lot will depend. I, I don't think in the last four years it's net negative, but I think there are meaningful opportunities and it's just interesting things teed up in areas like both. Um, in areas like special access, in areas like uh, uh, universal service, but particularly in areas like the the, uh, the burden on legacy incumbents to continue to maintain two redundant networks. One, all IP is what they're investing on their own, and then they still have to maintain a uh, legacy network, which is, I think, a vestige of an era gone by. That'd be a real opportunity if they want to make good on what the president said in July 2011. Yeah, people have focused on the damage done by all the spending, the, the five trillion dollars of additional debt built up, and the spending and the taxes that flowed from it, but the regulatory burdens that have started to show up and the ones that are only now showing up, um, I think are going to be every bit uh, as damaging. I mean, a whole series of, of, of regulations were written over the last four years and are only beginning to show up in public. Um, after the president got safely reelected. So once his job was secured, yours became negotiable. And there's this incredible wave of regulations coming, plus add all the stuff, regulations or laws, whichever you want to look at it, the stuff from um, the banking uh, regulatory bill, which are only now showing up, even some of them not yet written, and uh, Obamacare, the health care uh, legislation. Somebody made a decision when they looked at it should we show this to the American people before the election because it's so cool and they'll be so happy about what we're doing? Okay, we've seen everything that the answer to that was yes. That you saw. It's the law. It's a regulation. The ones where they said, let's not do that one yet. Let's wait until after the election because it's unpleasant, ugly, or costly. We could never explain it. Those are the ones that are showing up now. So we have four years of unpleasant news on the regulatory front. Um, I think we're just about at the end of our allocated time, so I'm going to ask the panelists um, if they would, uh, in turn, and I'll start with Blair to just offer us one parting thought here. If you could decree one uh, public policy decision that would make, uh, returning to the theme of our panel, make the Internet a, a stronger, more effective contributor to economic growth and jobs, and in one sentence, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> There's like you about 40 ideas in here, here but I, no, I, I actually, I, I really like Bruce's idea, um, but I think understanding government the way I do, um, you have to give it some real effect and you've got to move uh, more rapidly. So I think a, a base closing like commission designed to move the federal government to that faster, cheaper, better platform would be the idea. Uh, and that would drive a lot of different activities throughout the internet ecosystem. Let me go big picture enact the Ryan budget and the Ryan plan, which reforms all entitlement programs so they're self-sustaining and they don't crash and burn in 15 or uh, 30 years, which deals with today's overspending and reforms taxes to take the top corporate rate to 25 percent, doesn't do double taxation of, of uh, uh, savings and investment, and goes to a territorial tax system. You get the big things right, all industries do better. Bruce? Since we're in fantasy land, <laughs> uh, and I didn't mean that as you grow, 
I would, like uh, I would uh, abolish teachers' unions and pay teachers like we pay investment bankers. All right. <laughs> And my so, wife's not Katie, a teacher. Yeah. Commissioner, mm -hmm. you top that. So uh, I thought this was just about the internet. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Me too. But I, I give it Mine is. <laughs> but uh, I was just going to say, just in that narrow but large uh, world, just uh, to, to borrow uh, one of your uh, title of another book, which is just just leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Leave it alone. <laughs> So on that note, uh, would you please join me in uh, thanking the panelists, and we'll make room for the next one.